Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar on COVID-19, Ask the Experts. I would start with thanking my team who helped us uh, putting this together. And before I go on to introduce uh, our panelists for today, I'll quickly run you all through uh, some housekeeping details. This webinar will be recorded and shared widely. Feel free to submit questions anytime in the question box. The panelists are providing their views on the current situation as scientific experts and are not speaking on behalf of the government or the associated organizations. Our speakers for today are Dr. Shahid Jamil, the CEO of the Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance. Shahid is a virologist and the fellow of all the three Indian Science Academies. We also have with us Dr. Anand Bhan, who is the former president of the International Association of Bioethics. And uh, we are really happy to also have, again, Shubhra, who will be moderating the session. She is the chief editor for Nature India. Over to you, Shubhra. Thank you, Shuli, and welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. Um, so Shahid and Anant, I'll begin by uh, asking you how is life under lockdown? Well, it's 14 uh -huh. hour work days, so I guess it's, it's good. Okay. Yeah, Anand, I, uh, we hi, can't hear you, but we can still hear you. Yeah, hi, uh, good afternoon. Well, yes, it is uh, 14 day, uh, 14 hour work days. It's also, you know, Almost every day seems like the weekend, and the weekend seems like a weekday. You know, you can't really differentiate. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 interesting times. I don't think any of us in our lifetime has probably seen uh, seen a time period like this. But I guess we are all coping in different ways. Yeah. So thank you for coming out during this tough time, which uh, in which we are all besotted with work and sort of um, uh, snowed under with loads of things to do, not just. Uh, at the work front, but also on the home front. So thank you. Uh, it just seems, you know, being at home, um, trying to reach out to the wider world uh, seems uh, pretty irresponsible not to do that in these moments. And uh, especially to the media for which these uh, webinars uh, are, and we have lots of uh, non-media people also logging in. So. Uh, there's a great balance uh, of people who are hungry for information um, in, in these webinars, uh, logging in to find out the most scientific, scientifically accurate um, information. Uh, so um, I think what uh, we are trying to do is all to answer the questions that concern us as of today, because this is such a fast evolving situation. And every day we get to know new information, we get to get hold of new scientific studies. So uh, while we will try to answer those current questions, we will also try to answer some questions that certainly need reinforcement, certainly need answering again and again, uh, more so for the regional media who are who do not have access to too much of information and to the experts. Um, so we'll go very light uh, on today's uh, webinar uh, by way of uh, sort of trying to answer the questions but also not trying to make it look like the world is going to break down on us uh, uh, so um, uh, the first thing that i want to open this webinar with is uh, the concerns and uh, problems that the media is facing in these difficult times to cover news and to get to you the right information, especially the regional media. So some of the questions that have come to me via emails, WhatsApp, uh, after our last webinar, and uh, um, many people have called me also to um, sort of uh, make sense of these questions is, number one, in many areas of the country, newspapers are not reaching the intended audience, their intended uh, audiences, uh, the consumers. Uh, there are lots of media houses who are uh, working um, through PDFs, sending those PDFs, uh, putting them online or sending them via WhatsApp to their consumers. Um, many med regional media houses, very small newspapers, have actually 
shut shop in these uh, trying times because uh, journalists cannot go out into the field and uh, cover news uh, in the in these risky times um so those were some of the very current questions that i got but since they are not really linked to science we'll jump over to some of the science questions that need answering and uh, some of the questions that we received after the last webinar as well as we are receiving now uh, shall i go over to you and ask you directly uh, the first question is about testing which is uh, sort of uh, gripping everybody's mind and who has been uh, saying test 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 and what what exactly are the testing strategy strategies globally available right now what are the key differences uh, about the pros and cons of each of these strategies where is india right now how much are we testing how fast are the test results are going to be available to a normal person so let me begin shubhra uh, the testing that is being done right now is using a test which is called a real time pcr test it tests for the genetic material of the virus this test is typically taking 7 to 8 hours and india has currently ramped up its capacity to do about 10000 tests a day as of yesterday uh, we have tested uh, 27700 samples uh it started off slow but it has picked up speed the challenges obviously are both uh, logistic challenges as well as the availability of tests and my understanding is that initially government of india had ordered about 1 lakh tests uh, 100000 tests uh but subsequently orders have been placed for uh, i believe up to 10 lakh tests so in the days to come there would be enough tests available and clearly uh, the testing has increased it should go up even further uh, unless we do that we will really not know we will not have any data on community spread of the virus so the challenges really are both material challenges as well as logistic challenges having enough trained people having enough containment facilities and all those are being ramped up so i think we are well on the way to testing more okay and uh, uh, how early can these tests be made available results be made available to people who are testing well at this time as i said it, it's taking about 7 to 8 hours and if somebody comes as a clear negative they are reported to be negative if somebody comes out to be either a clear positive or a doubtful then that person is retested to confirm uh, so it is taking time uh, but that's the inherent nature of the test this is not a test that can be done by the bedside or uh, you know done in a physician's office this needs special facilities i understand that government of india has now contracted out to a private firm which claims to be putting together a test that will give results in about 2 and a half hours but that is yet to be verified uh, and its uh, sensitivity and specificity are yet to be checked so we are we are getting there but you know it's it's taking time uh shubhra you started talking about uh media and the challenges that media is facing uh what in your view are the challenges that regional media is facing uh, we sit in places like delhi and ba delhi bombay and bangalore and don't really understand what regional media is facing that's right so i have been chatting with my friends uh, from across uh, the country um in the media houses and uh, some of the questions that are really uh, you know top of the mind of these regional houses right now are how safe are the journalists going into the field covering uh, a pandemic which is which can be spread so easily uh, through uh, through a person who has who is uh, tested positive or who is carrying the um, virus without any of uh, 
us around knowing since uh, we know that um, and we are discussing this very very often about uh, how much community transmission there might be in india we have no idea about that so so media persons who are out there overwhelmed with these figures uh, or from all across the world and going into the field to assert ascertain these figures for, for themselves the risks that they face uh, of of contracting the virus themselves is uh, getting the infection is is pretty high and uh, so uh, I spoke to one of my friends in uh, in an audiovisual media in Raipur, who who have you know the the media house themselves have created some guidelines about uh, these people going out into the open and covering news. What should they be doing? Uh, some of those guidelines apply to most of us who are also going to buy out buy um, you know going out to buy a grocery or or even. Uh, just to go out uh, of home to pick up our newspapers, etc. So, uh, so I think uh, the main things that they are also doing are what WHO recommends or any uh, national body recommends uh, in these times is uh, making use of the masks uh, and uh, maintaining a safe distance and using hand hygiene, which um, can be cannot be overemphasized. The need for which cannot be. Um, uh, told again and again, you know, you see, we, we need to have those in place. So uh, apart from that, media houses are now also starting to think about uh, giving some leave and rotating their staff who are covered, covering COVID-19. As we know that a um, lot of people in the regional media, a lot of region media actually do not have specialized science or health reporters as such. So uh, it's the general beat reporters, such as somebody who was covering the Vidhan Sabha, the state assembly uh, till uh, recently, is also covering COVID-19 today. So, uh, so the challenges for those people uh, also is access to correct information. What in the age of uh, WhatsApp uh, infodemic and, uh, and um, such information making its way to uh, our homes through our phones, uh, and through the through the internet, we are overloaded with uh, misinformation. And so, uh, I can understand the challenge for those journalists not to, uh, you know, not just uh, to allay those fears that come through WhatsApp, but also, uh, you know, be responsible and report those stories every day. So the regional houses, which are actually thinking of rotating staff. To, uh, to go out into the field and then not using those staff for uh, 10 days uh, or 15 days uh, to cover the uh, epidemic, uh, the pandemic uh, is, is a sane idea, I think. So I'll, um, I'll keep coming back to the challenges probably more, but media might be waiting to uh, hear other questions being answered. So I'll go over to Anant uh, and ask him, while well, the government has, uh, invited private players and is extending these uh, testing facilities as i just mentioned uh, to do you have any suggestions on how we can reduce the stigma around these tests and also maintain privacy of people opting for these tests the fact that even if uh, 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 you know we have means to get um, tested from a private facility people will walk into our homes wearing hazmat suits uh, recognizable equipment is scary and I know some of my friends in Delhi itself have sent me WhatsApp messages uh, showing uh, you know labels uh, in front of their houses which show which say they are under quarantine and how people are stigmatized uh, on the basis of just being quarantined. Sure, thanks, Shubra. So I think you know there are a few elements to uh, to that. Uh, one is obviously the availability of testing, um, as uh, Professor Shahid just alluded to. Part of the challenge was that we had uh, not enough testing happening, which could uh, which could be accessed, uh, but that has now since been ramped up, which is a positive. Uh, private players have also been roped in, and so I'm sure there is a lot of interest for people wanting to access that uh, that testing. But there's going to be a few challenges. One is going to be the cost element of it. Um, to have individuals to come to your home, uh, 
for you to get tested will require them to be uh, obviously having basic precautions, which is uh, personal protective equipment, but that uh, will uh, increase the cost per test. And secondly, as you are rightly pointing out, there is still a fair bit of stigma uh, around uh, either being quarantined or being identified as being uh, tested positive. There are enough uh, lists going around on our WhatsApp circles. There are uh, enough photos being circulated. And uh, there are enough stories about um, individuals who work in the healthcare sector being uh, asked to leave uh, by, by their landlords as well, which shows clearly that stigma is a major issue. So I think the response obviously requires one element, which often is not talked about as much in detail, which is community engagement. People need to understand that the only way to actually tackle this uh, this growing pandemic is uh, requires us to do widespread testing. And if testing is only going to be uh, available at a few uh, central uh, institutions, then it's going to be difficult for everyone to access it, uh, especially given the lockdown as well. So making it accessible as close as uh, to your uh, residents uh, is probably a good idea. There might be some people who want to pay for it and get access, access to it at home, but then there is always going to be a, a, a calculus around uh, will they be comfortable with people walking up and, and testing them, given that there is stigma attached to it? So obviously, we need to, uh, we need to address the stigma element more uh, across the board rather than specifically to this issue of, uh, of you know, labeling uh, or branding of, of households and talk about why, by increasing testing, we are actually helping in, uh, in addressing the spread of the pandemic and that people need to cooperate. And, and if they want access to testing at home, and if they want uh, us to be able to tide over uh, the growing spread of the pandemic, then one way to do that is to test more people, identify people, isolate them, and, and prevent further spread. And to do that, we have to cooperate and, and not stigmatize. So I think it's going to be uh, something which requires both a proactive engagement from, uh, from all relevant stakeholders, scientists, policymakers, the government, but also cooperation from all of us, which is the lay public in ensuring that uh, we don't let stigma in, uh, come uh, in the way of, of an effective response. So Shubhra, I have a question coming in right now as we are talking about testing. This question is for uh, Dr. Jameel. At the moment, we are testing only when all the three symptoms are seen. So do you think we should test more frequently even with one of the symptoms? I missed the early part of your question. Okay, so uh, at the moment, uh, we are testing only when all the three symptoms are seen in a patient. So should we be testing for more, uh, testing more frequently, even with one of the symptoms? Yes, of course. I mean, yeah. we should be testing more frequently, but you know, again, it's a, it's a trade-off. Uh, by now we have, pretty good idea as to what the symptoms are based on experience around the world. So just okay. because somebody has an allergy and watery eyes and runny nose, uh, no fever or anything, you know, it's, it's probably futile to go and, and get tested. Uh, you are more likely to catch something at the, at the testing place. Uh, so, you know, be sensible about this just because you, may have an allergy, you don't really need to go and, and get tested. It's always going to be a trade-off. I mean, this, this is not going to be very black and white. But yes, as a matter of uh, principle, we should be testing more people who have symptoms, more people who have pneumonia, for example, uh, okay. all kinds of pneumonia. And now pneumonia has been made a reportable, uh, pneumonia has been made a reportable uh, sort of uh, disease. Uh, so uh, it's it's important to test more, but again, okay. we need to be, be we need to be sensible about this. Thank you. Right. Uh, so I'll just come in uh, for a question for both uh, Shahid and Anant and uh, uh, from a global context, uh, the first part is for you, Shahid. Uh, is there any regional variation on the impact of uh, COVID-19, given Indian and African population is young, could this reduce the number of people affected by COVID-19? That's a question that's been doing rounds. And for Anant, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, there's, um, uh, 
for COVID-19 vaccine trials in humans, um, much has been initiated without animal data. Many experts uh, have supported this move, uh, but what would this mean from the bioethics perspective? What are the risks? Let, let me start answering, Shubhra. You talked about regional uh, age-specific uh, effects. Well, one thing is quite clear from the experience of China, Italy, and other places, that people who are older suffer worse disease, and their mortality is also higher uh, if your age is 60 or above, especially if you're 80 or above. But to, to think that younger people are not going to be infected, are not going to be affected, is, I think, the wrong notion. Uh, examples in the US have shown that even younger people are coming down with infection and disease. Uh, in India, as well as in Africa, we also have the problem of poor nutrition. Uh, so how will that uh, you know, play out in, uh, with, with people getting disease. We don't know. So my message here would be don't be complacent, thinking that India is a younger population and therefore uh, the effects will be less on India. India also has the world's higher num highest number of uh, people with diabetes. India also has uh, a very high numbers of people with poor lung function because of air pollution, because of smoking, because of indoor cooking, all of those things. So how this will intersect with the virus, we don't know yet. Uh, so please don't be under any false illusions that we are a younger population and therefore it will affect us less. Thanks. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so good question to ask. I mean, I think, you know, uh, from an ethics perspective, especially um, in terms of preventive uh, modalities, vaccine being uh, one of the main areas that potentially there'll be a lot of work in, there are three elements which are important. One is safety, uh, the second one is efficacy, and the third one is cost effectiveness. And and the last one makes, uh, you know, the most difference for, for a low and middle income country context, because obviously if the final vaccine is too expensive, then uh, how much you will be able to actually scale uh, scale up its uh, its uh, use in uh, in your population will will always be a question. But more specifically, on the first two elements, safety and efficacy, I think that's what we are really chasing. I mean, it, so it was interesting because uh, I think Professor uh, Anthony Fauci, who is one of the probably you know the most respected infectious disease experts in the world, was also speaking to this issue recently um, in in a con press conference, and he was highlighting that. You know, we have to really find that balance between ensuring safety and then looking at efficacy. If we skip a few steps, we are uh, also possibly increasing the risk element. And that's why we need to then figure out that if we are actually uh, trying to expedite the speed with which uh, vaccine development happens, which is important because uh, as was pointed out by him as well, there have been situations where like for Zika or for SARS, we did come up uh, with an advanced vaccine candidate, but by that time the, the disease spread had already, you know, winded down. So you sort of had a candidate uh, which you could have used, but then you didn't really have much utility for it. So you know, the, the disease had winded down on its own. Uh, so you want to make sure that speed is an element, but you cannot sacrifice safety because there have been enough past experiences, also with potentially vaccine candidates uh, leading to disease uh, or infection enhancement. And that is not a risk you want to take. So there is a judicious mix which is uh, required. And I think something which allows for, for example, you to do phase one studies while you're also doing animal studies might be in model, which uh, which is probable. And that has been also suggested by a few experts. So we don't skip any step, but we maybe try to do some steps together or at least you know reduce the time between the steps so that we don't uh, sacrifice any of the key elements around safety and efficacy. Because what you don't want at the end is a vaccine candidate which could potentially harm and and that harm is only uh, becoming apparent to us when we actually give it to people so we want to protect against that and the, uh, the way to the only way to do that is to do our science right and to do randomized control trials uh, of, of any of the preventive modalities including vaccines or uh, or the treatment modalities which might be drugs 
so we should be uh, you know we should obviously be careful about uh, all of those elements yet ensuring that we do uh, you know we do our science in a more efficient way so that we reduce the time required to get to a product which can be used because i think time is 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 obviously at, uh, in short supply right time uh, at this point of time as the spread continues okay so uh, since so, we are uh, talking about vaccines uh, already uh, i think uh, shait if you can just tell us where exactly is the world on vaccine research and trials right now well uh, as per who there are about 40 different four zero different uh, candidates that are in development. Uh, the two most advanced ones are one from a company called Moderna uh, in US, which is under trial right now, is in phase one trial that Anand was talking about. Uh, and these trials are being done under the control of the National Institutes of Health uh, in US. This is a RNA vaccine. Uh, the other vaccine which has moved uh, further uh, beyond lab development is a partnership between a US company called Codagenics and uh, the Serum Institute of India in Pune. Uh, this is based on a weakened or attenuated strain of the virus. Uh, they have developed this platform and uh, Serum Institute is going to be upscaling it and manufacturing it initially for animal trials and human trials. So I think the closest we are to a vaccine, we are, we are about 18 months away. Maybe it can be speeded up to about, I don't know, 14 months, 16 months, 12 months. I would put maybe 18 months as uh, a safe bet for the first vaccine. Now, we must understand that these are all candidates. There is no guarantee that any of these will show efficacy or the protective ability when given to humans. So that's where we are. Okay. Shirley, you want to come in with a question? Uh, no, that was my question. Uh, the okay. one okay. Uh, that you took up now. Okay, fine. So, um, Anand, I'll come back to you then. Um, how do you think other disciplines can be engaged in fighting this pandemic? I mean, uh, uh, Shai just wrote a piece for Nature India where he talked about collaboration and uh, why India will lose out if we do not, uh, you know, immediately ramp up collaborative activities between the organizations which are uh, working towards developing a uh, some any sort of stance have a stance on COVID-19 research or around the virus. So um, you know we see techies using network mapping tools and creating cluster maps to help understand the disease spread. What kind of innovative partnerships do you foresee or suggest that one needs to help improve the entire response? Sure. So, I mean, if there's anything we've learned, I think, um, from responding to past infectious disease, um, either epidemics or pandemics, is that uh, the response needs to be uh, multi-sectoral and intersectoral. Um, you know, for example, if we are talking about developing anything um, as, as a cohesive response for COVID-19, it cannot just be uh, lab science, it cannot just be uh, clinical science, it cannot just be public health approaches. It also requires you to work with sociologists, uh, with anthropologists, to try to understand how communities understand infection, how infection spreads, how you can work with communities to enhance community engagement, participation in research, and, and also, you know, how to uh, then talk about uh, uptake of anything that you might come up with, which is either a public health intervention or it is a biomedical intervention, whether that be a vaccine or not. If there's anything we've learned from HIV, you know, it's it's the importance of actually having all of those approaches and working closely with communities. You can add have you can have a magic bullet, but that magic bullet will not be effective unless people actually are willing to take it, right? And uh, it's the same with uh, with the efficacy of any public health measure uh, like containment or mitigation or lockdowns. Only if people understand why it is important to uh, to take those steps and they agree to adhere to those 
by by being convinced about it will you actually have success so you know the kind of uh, issues which are still being reported of people sometimes not adhering uh, to uh, to the advice public health measures indicates that there is some kind of a lack of clear communication or understanding and that is something that you know working with experts in that domain whether that be health communication uh, communications or sociologists or or people who are experts in community engagement can help now similarly as you are rightly pointing out you know there is a lot of tech uh, uh, you know the advantages of technology as well as biotech which can be leveraged i mean india has a, has a deep um, expertise in in technology and one example where i like to provide uh, is is a group that i have i have just started uh, you know interacting with which is also looking at developing an app there's a lot of people working on apps right now which might help with contact tracing or which might help you give you know some indication of risk for example but a lot of people for example a lot of times people don't understand the importance of also keeping in mind concerns around stigma around privacy and confidentiality so that's another example where if you start having those conversations at the development phase then you try to preempt some of those downstream problems of using technology if technologists don't understand the public health limitations or the public health uh, advantages of what they are trying to come up with and vice versa that you know the public health folks who are going to be the end consumers don't understand the intricacies of technology uh, then you know it's not going to be much useful at the end and hence having those discussions having partnerships right up front in the design phase of any intervention becomes important because then you can integrate those inputs as you develop that uh, that intervention or that technology and that again is an example of why it's important to have those partnerships and working closely with each other and that applies to the government as well i mean the government i think now understands that anything that they need to do whether logistics whether a public health response whether coming up with something which people are willing to adopt uh, whether widespread testing requires you to work with the widespread uh, you know uh, a widespread of sectors and i think that is what uh, hopefully will make things change uh, for for the good okay so um, while we are at the question of collaboration i'll i'll also want to bring in the two calls one by the who and uh, another by our own niti ayog uh, um, and so um, i want to ask you shahid first and then we'll go over to the question of community transmission which many people are worried about in india uh, what is the status of the who multi country study solidarity and india's possible participation in it and to you anand uh, you previously advocated for engaging non practicing doctors and now niti ayog has come out with uh, a call could you explain who this call is for and where will people be volunteering what is the plan uh shubhra i really don't know where whether the government is participating in the multi country response or not uh who i believe does has have something like that but it's i believe it's not mandatory for every government to participate in it uh, that's how who works uh, but it would be in our best interest to uh, report on time report properly to also track the infection well in our country and involve international partners uh, in the analysis of the outbreak that's happening in india we are still at a fairly early stage we have done the right things in terms of uh, you know restrictions and uh, from a scientific point of view i'm not talking about a sociological point of view that's another dimension to it uh, so it, it is in our interest to participate and, and collaborate uh, I don't have the details, so I don't want to speculate. Uh, so, uh, Shubhra, uh, on the community transmission, there is a very basic uh, question that has been coming in again and again. So, how are we defining the community and how are we differentiating the community? Are there efforts ongoing to make specific testing to people representing the community who are at risk? For example, individuals who are hearing about the virus and precautionary advisories, but not necessarily understanding the risk. Thank you. Before that, uh, I'll just let, let Anand answer this, the CPIO question, and then he can go. Both okay. of them can go. Sure, over sure, sure. 
Okay. Thank you. Okay, so can I, uh, so do I respond now? Yes. Yeah, please. sure. Okay. Yes. Uh, all right. So, um, you know, some of us have advocated that uh, given that uh, we have some constraints in our health system, both infrastructural and human resources, that it would be wise for us to now think through how to um, ensure that we are able to address both of those challenges. So, yes, you can get more uh, you know, isolation beds prepared. You can get more... Um, ICU units ready, maybe you can get more ventilators as well. And I think there's a lot of work happening on that. A lot of innovators participating in that uh, exercise of trying to come up with ventilators uh, on, on a quicker delivery uh, uh, timeline. But the challenge is also going to be you need trained staff who can run the, this infrastructure. And, and we have a limitation that we don't have enough, um, in, you know, in, enough internists, enough emergency medicine doctors, enough nursing staff, enough paramedical staff who might be trained in how to run an ICU or a ventilator for that matter. Um, so what we have advocated is that this is a time that we should be looking at some, uh, you know, uh, some thinking around how we could get more people trained in the short term. There are a lot of staff, for example, in medical colleges who might be, belong to the preclinical or paraclinical stream. They might be, uh, so uh, you know, they might be doctors like ENT surgeons who also uh, can work on, uh, on intubation. Uh, it's for each uh, hospital to look at what resources they might already have and then see where is there a chance for us to do some uh, urgent uh, capacity building so that you have backup staff available who can step in uh, if there is one, an exhaustion of your main team, because obviously this, you know, if there is too, there are too many patients, then exhaustion and, and is going to be an issue. Or worst case scenario, they get sick or they get infected and then they need to go into quarantine. Okay, so we are uh, getting a huge lot of oh, questions right. about whether uh, India has entered stage three, according to you, of COVID-19, um, you know, and whether this lockdown is effective as a strategy against that, and how equipped do you think India is for communities to tackle community spread? What happens when this virus enters urban slums in India? Who are you giving this question to? Any other? Any <laughs> okay, all right. Let me, uh, uh, let, let me just start first addressing what one means by community. So when we're talking about community transmission, we're talking about transmission that is happening uh, independent of somebody who brought the virus from outside. So let's say somebody traveled to India from Italy. Now, this person would not be called community. People who have come into contact with this person would not be called, first contact would not be called community. But if the virus is transmitting to other people who have neither been outside India, nor have come into contact with somebody who's come from outside India, that's how we are defining community. Now, whether community transmission is happening or not, you simply look at the rate of increase of positive cases in the country, and you will see that uh, community transmission is probably happening. <laughs> you know, some of it could also be testing, but to go from one case to 50 case, it took us nine days. And subsequently to go to 100 cases, 200 cases, 500 cases, it's been taking us on an average four to five days. Our outbreak is now has a doubling time of four to five days. The travel restrictions have been put up at least three weeks back. Uh, so what we are seeing now, the rise in infections, I believe some of it is community transmission. Some of it is also increased testing. So I think we are slowly beginning to see community transmission. Anant, your views on it, please. Yes, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, again, 
a lot of people feel community transmission is already happening because we have had uh, quite a few cases where you've not been able to establish, establish contact tracing. And quite honestly, I think at some point of time, uh, it doesn't really matter. I think we are now in a stage where we've seen uh, a lot of states with cases. We've also seen discrete clusters in many states. So uh, we have to assume that we have to prepare for a situation where if it is not already there, it, we might get there very soon. And uh, what is obviously going to worry us is situations like what you described, which is urban slums or rural areas with a high density of population. Because once spread happens there, then it's going to be extremely difficult for the response to be effective, given that we have system, uh, system constraints. So the only way actually to prevent that uh, scenario from happening or to reduce that possibility is to be aggressive in our testing and is to be aggressive in our public health measures. And to ensure that we are able to um, test, uh, identify and isolate those who are infected and that we continue our, uh, our campaign around public health measures like social distancing and, and make people understand. Now that's easy for many of us to say who are middle class individuals who, you know, who have spaces available in our households to do uh, quarantine. And it's much more difficult in, in a rural setting. You know, I was just talking to a friend who was describing that uh, they, uh, he lives in the upper, uh, in, in the upper, in the Tons Valley in Uttarakhand where they've not had power for the last 72 hours. And the temperatures are around three to four degrees centigrade. And so obviously people or households are going to, you know, uh, find uh, places where they can burn some fires and, you know, uh, collectivize against around that to, to get warm. And how do you actually preach social distancing in, in that scenario, right? So that's the kind of practical challenges of, of ensuring uh, social distancing are. And that is true of urban slums as well. You know, when you have one household with five or 10 individuals and one small room, how much social distancing can you practice? So I think, it, you know, that, that's the practical element that, you know, we have to be realistic about what is possible. But within that realism, we have to try to maximize the efficiency of these measures and ensure that we prevent spread. Because if the spread becomes too widespread, uh, as we've seen in countries like Italy, uh, to some extent, Iran for, as well, then it becomes very, very difficult. And the systems around us, whether the health systems or the social systems can begin to collapse. And that is something which would be um, obviously some very scary in our scenario. So let's try to minimize that possibility by, by you know, working together to, uh, to prevent that kind of uh, calamity happening, for lack of a better word, because that is really a scary scenario for many of us. And, uh, and we still have some degree of time but not a lot of time uh, to prevent that. Shabra, let me come in here and address one related issue. Uh, from a scientific, from a public health point of view, the lockdown is necessary. The lockdown is timely. But if anyone believes that we are going to be free of the virus after 21 days, they're dreaming. This is not going to happen most likely the government will have to take a decision to do further lockdowns maybe in phases open up for some time follow then do another lockdown i think we are in this for some time to come uh, so please those of you who are writing about it don't be under this illusion that 21 days and we will come out clean and everything will be hunky dory it won't be that's the reality yeah sure we have uh, tons of questions coming in and though we addressed the question of uh, using hydroxychloroquine in our last uh, webinar i'll very quickly ask you shai uh, uh, if that is prudent as a prophylactic drug uh, doesn't it have side effects uh, do the side effects actually outweigh the pros and cons uh, pros uh, of the of the drug. Sorry, uh, what about using other immunomodulators uh, to treat? Uh, one is that, and uh, very quickly, the world maps showing malaria endemic regions. I know we wanted to bring in a malaria expert for this webinar, but uh, Shahid, you can certainly answer the question about uh, this WhatsApp message going around where the endemic regions of malaria. Uh, you know, circum uh, juxtaposed to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic situation, 
and looks like yeah. malaria endemic areas are relatively protected from covid 19 what are your comments on that first up chloroquine uh, chloroquine has only been shown in a small trial in france on 40 people that chloroquine and azithromycin have improved the clearance rate of the virus this was not a random control trial uh, so chloroquine has only been approved both by us fda as well as by government of india to be used as a therapeutic drug in clinical trials as an experimental drug in clinical trials this does not mean that people can go around popping chloroquine tablets and think that it will prevent infection there is no basis for this there is no data on this on the contrary chloroquine can lead to some toxicity so i will request all of you journalists there to please dispel this notion that chloroquine can be taken as a preventive i have seen those facebook messages and those whatsapp messages showing maps i have also seen scientists trying to give scientific explanations to it saying that chloroquine uh, is a long lasting drug its half life is long when it is excreted out it gets into the groundwater and all of those things those are all conjectures nothing is proven uh, so till somebody does a careful study it remains only a correlation there is really no basis for it it's an interesting observation but beyond that there is nothing to it anand very quickly i'll ask you about a very interesting question which has come out come here uh, about what are your recommendations to a community hospital trying to carry out surgeries especially in the area of semi urgent situations which is elective surgeries um, it is recommended by experts to avoid routine surgeries but these uh, surgeries such as cancer surgeries uh, fall in the gray zone yeah so so well uh, most hospitals uh, have suspended uh, elective surgeries uh, and elective procedures and routine opds um, obviously emergency care needs to continue and emergency surgical care is a subset of that and uh, it's very important i think also to reiterate that just because covid 19 is on us and is spreading uh, we should make sure that at least basic services whether those be sanitation whether those be routine public health programs around immunization maternal and child health care obstetric care uh, surgical care for emergency settings all of those need to be made uh, available and should be running you know you don't, what you don't want is just because uh, a lot of resources are being put into COVID-19, that there be a rebound of, for example, other infectious diseases because we were not paying enough attention. And, and that is a worry I think a lot of people in public health have that, you know, we need to be extra cautious about that. That while we ensure that we are obviously adequately resourcing for our response to COVID-19, we do not do it at the cost of our basic services, uh, at least being running at a minimum quality level. So I think the uh, the uh, the answer will actually lie with pretty much the hospital and and the operating surgeon if they feel that they can defer the operation for a while then it is ideal but if they feel that time is not something that they have and that there is a need to intervene quickly then they should go ahead with adequate precautions just as they would take for any other case uh, obviously uh, that might depend on also what that facility is if that facility gets a lot of patients who are general patients a lot of patients with serious respiratory ailments, then they might take a different decision around either doing it in C2 in their hospital or referring out. But if it's a smaller hospital, which in an area which has not yet seen many cases or does not has not seen any cases at all, then they might go ahead with uh, with that operation. And maybe now is the time to do it before we might have further spread and then it becomes even more difficult. But I think that should be an individual clinical discretion and also based on uh, the plus minus of what that would mean for that patient and, and their well-being. Um, and, and they should take that decision accordingly. But yes, elective procedures, I think a lot of people are differing for now where possible. 
Okay. Um, we know that the FDA has now allowed treatment of critical cases with blood from patients who have recovered. Uh, do you think there might be chances of AD of infection there? What's your opinion about that procedure? So the blood uh, that we're talking about is essentially plasma. And uh, the logic is that people who have recovered already have antibodies in their blood, in their plasma against COVID-19. And when given to a patient, will neutralize the virus. There is sound logic to it. It has been practiced in the past. Uh, passive immunoprophylaxis is what it is called. Uh, it will not transmit other infections because the plasma is treated at 50 degrees for, uh, I believe, 30 minutes, which uh, inactivates uh, most viruses, certainly this virus, uh, and it doesn't destroy the antibodies. Uh, so it is safe and it has been practiced very widely uh, there's a lot of experience in the world for this. Uh, one question is about uh, whether India should immediately start looking at the Korea model and uh, use it. Can it be scaled up? Anand, you want to attempt that? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, so again, you know, each country has to come up with its own model. I don't think there is a magic model which will work everywhere. There are certain lessons certainly to be learned from every country which has done well, right? So South Korea is a good example of a country which was seeing a rapid spread of infection and managed to actually, as they say, bend the curve um, um, and reduce the number of new infections coming through. And they did it through aggressive testing. Uh, they didn't have as much of a lockdown approach as we've had, but they did certainly have widespread testing available um, at as close to you would be um, and try to use that to try to identify cases early and isolate them. Uh, they also have used technology a lot, um, which is um, uh, which also worked well for, for, for them. But then, you know, we are a different country, right? You know, not everything which is possible in another country might work for us. But yes, I think one uh, learning from South Korea, which I think we certainly need to look at is a ramped up testing strategy, which allows for more tests to be available as close to the individual as possible with uh, with a quicker turnaround time because a quicker turnaround time for test was also something that South Korea offered with the kind of test that they use, which means that you, as soon as you get tested within a few hours, you have the test result and that can mean uh, a public health action can be initiated very quickly. So I think there is a lot to learn from many other contexts. Let's not say that we should be copying anything, but yes, we should learn from all of those and, and come up with, a, with uh, uh, an approach which works well for us. Uh, because I think that would be in our interest uh, to not feel that there is not something which cannot be applied here. It needs to be contextualized, but it can certainly be learned from. There are very many interesting questions pouring in, but uh, we are running out of time. So I'll ask just one last question to both of you. And um, actually two. Uh, one is about uh, the vitamin D. Somebody has pointed out that we are all deficient in vitamin D and so that really works out to be how immune we are to such assaults on our bodies. Uh, what's your take on that? Is India particularly at risk because of the vitamin D deficiency? I have found no evidence uh, for this. Uh, it's all conjecture at this point. Uh, it's it, it's no different than uh, the malaria versus COVID hypothesis. Okay. okay, and the last one that I want to wind up with is a really public interest question, uh, which everybody wants to know. And Shahid, uh, you were talking about it this morning uh, uh, on how to pick up your milk packets and newspapers. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and is there an effective way of doing that since we are with news people uh, that that would be a question we want to end with well i i don't know what you should be doing but i can certainly tell you what uh, i have done uh, for newspaper this morning uh, 
I used one of those, uh, you know, chimtas or forceps, uh, which you use for roti to pick up the newspaper from outside my door. Uh, I lay it on another old newspaper on the floor, got an iron, uh, a clothes iron, uh, put it on dry heat, and treated my the the top of my newspaper with that, opened it and treated the inside. And I could see that it was hot enough to kill any virus. Then, you know, I did it to all the three newspapers I read, and I was happy to read my newspapers after that. And I think it's it's reasonable, it's logical. Uh, uh, so if you think that works for you, you may want to use it. If the newspaper is even delivered to your door, I think it's many newspapers are not yeah. being delivered. That's about right. any other package whether it's milk or anything else uh, when you bring it into the house uh, please you know wash it things that you can wash with soap and water you must wash with soap and water uh, if you can't wash it if it's in a cardboard container you know like you're getting conflicts for example uh, keep the container outside the you know bring just the plastic packet inside that is safe for you to bring inside. So just use common sense. I think that's very important. Any last thoughts, Anand? No, I think uh, you know these are uh, these are tough times, but these are also interesting times. I think you know all of us have a role to play. I think uh, you know just basic public health measures, common sense, as Professor Jamil was saying. Just uh, you know. Try to ensure that you conform to social distancing, wash your hands as frequently as possible. Uh, also take care of yourself. I think a lot of people have also have uh, you know, other comorbidities. So just make sure you continue your medication. Get some exercise indoors if you can. Take care of your mental health. Um, you know, try to avoid uh, getting too excited about WhatsApp forwards, which uh, claim magic cures. Uh, there is a lot of scientists doing really hard work. There are a lot of teams at it. If there is something which works, we will know uh, from the scientists pretty soon. In the interim, it serves us well to just uh, follow instructions which are coming from credible sources. Uh, avoid, uh, you know, avoid panic situations. Avoid rebound uh, social interactions. There have been already a few cases where, whenever there's been some relaxation of a lockdown, it happened in Assam, I think, a day ago. There have been people, um, you know, uh, just going and thronging markets and that's going to put you at higher risk. So just make sure that you use your common sense, minimize chances of getting uh, infection, and uh, and support you know the authorities and the government in the response. And and also at the same time, um, ask for uh, for basic precautions to be enhanced. So our health workers need our support at this point of time. They need personal protective equipment. If we can all advocate for that as as a collective, that would be really useful. Um, and I think you know these kinds of conversations help. And and I'm sure. Um, you you all through the platform will continue it, but you know just keep talking to individuals who can probably give you some expert advice uh, rather than trusting uh, non-credible sources of information. It, it's important to be on top of the infodemic as well. Shubhra, I just wanted to add one thing to end uh, about this infodemic that is happening uh, along with this pandemic. Uh, just like Anand said, you get a lot of uh, you know WhatsApp messages. Uh, and it says, you know, forwarded as received. Uh, now, I think it's each of us have this responsibility that if we get something and if you're not able to verify it, please don't forward it. If you have a smartphone and you're getting a WhatsApp, you also have the ability to verify it fairly quickly. So just use common sense and don't spread false news don't become yeah. a part of that break the absolutely. chain absolutely break the chain of infodemic misinfodemic and uh, thank you both we have as i said lots of questions from the media about practices that the media can do so i can tell the media people out here that we are compiling a set of guidelines specific to india how to cover uh, a pandemic in india uh, and it could actually be a uh, uh, sort of uh, guideline for the entire world because this pandemic is new and everybody is coping with covering it 
in their own way. So uh, I'll write up a piece on that later on Nature India and we can circulate it to all the media people who have logged in. Uh, thank you both very much for the insightful um, presentations and questions and answers from all of all of you. Uh, back to you, Sivli. Thank you. Thank you, Shibra, for moderating the panel uh, discussion today. Thank you, Dr. Jamil, and thank, thank you, Dr. Anand, for uh, joining in. Uh, you are very right. Uh, we have got many questions coming in, and we will be bringing um, our listeners many more webinars in this series. Uh, we have been uh, getting uh, requests to uh, translate the uh, transcript of these webinars into uh, regional languages and we are working on them um, but before we end this uh, we would like to give an opportunity to all of our speakers to emphasize on what they think india needs to focus on right now dr jameel sorry again i missed you what should india ha, so focus a quick on word, right a quick a quick word from all of you, all three of you, on what you think India needs needs to focus on now. A quick word. Uh, India needs to be testing more. Uh, India needs to be ramping up its uh, healthcare facilities for the coming peak. Uh, and India needs to be, uh, you know, sensitive to the needs of the poor people who are really caught between a hard, rock and a hard place here. Yes, sure. Uh, Shubhra. Yeah, I think India also needs to look after its medical professionals. Uh, we haven't talked about them too much uh, in, in this series, but uh, it would be prudent to have just one webinar for medical professionals, if you will, you know, addressing their concerns. Uh, so I think the biggest worry for them is lack of resources. They are at the front line working for us. And I have WhatsApp messages from my doctor friends saying you haven't really asked this important question about protection of uh, healthcare workers. Uh, so sure. yeah, I think we need to do more on that. Absolutely noted that. And uh, we hopefully will be having one webinar uh, for our uh, healthcare professionals. Anand, a quick word on this. Anand? I think we've lost him. Anand, can you? Okay, okay. So, uh, okay, so uh, let's wind up the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Jamil. Thank you, Shubhra. Uh, I'll thank Anand later. And uh, we have listed here, we have a list of resources that the people from media can go through in their own time. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you.